Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes the progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and ending corporate domination. Today we're going to continue our conversation with Charles Johnson, director of the task, Joint Task Force on Nuclear Power with the Oregon and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. He was on our, our, our show uh, last week, and if you missed that program, I hope you'll go back to our website at uh, populistdialogues.org and watch it there. Following our conversation today with Mr. Johnson, we will run part of an interview recorded earlier with Portland attorney Dan Meek talking about changes the Oregon legislature is considering to the Oregon Bottle Bill and Oregon's Indoor Clean Air Act. So welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be back. Right. Good. It's, it's good to have you back. Uh, so uh, last time we were talking about small nuclear module reactors mm -hmm. uh, and, the, uh, and the attempt in the Oregon legislature to pass this SB 990 to uh, override a citizen's initiative. Right. Uh, when was that initiative? It uh, passed in uh, 1980. 1980, so it's been law uh, almost 40 years. Yeah, Wow. exactly. And wow. they still haven't found a permanent disposal site for high-level nuclear waste. So right. which, was the, which was the requirement of the initiative that before you build additional nuclear facilities in the state of Oregon, you had to have a national deposit repository. Deposit repository, repository, repository site for the nuclear waste, right. as well as getting approval statewide from voters for such a uh, a, a, a site. So, right. um, SB nine ninety tried to work around that by, yeah, uh, basically it said that if a reactor smaller than three hundred megawatts, that it wouldn't have to meet this uh, nuclear waste storage requirement. And uh, secondly, that votes could, uh, you know, if, if local governments voted to site a plant like that, either a city or a county, only the city or county would be allowed to vote on it rather than the entire state. Okay, all right. So uh, under, undermining the fine work that citizens did at the ballot uh, almost 40 years ago. Right. Okay. Uh, but it's dead. It's dead. It's, it's dead. dead. Thanks That's to the, the outpouring of, mm -hmm. of people who, once we realized it was happening, uh, to pass the Senate really before organized opposition emerged, but it got killed in the House Environment and Energy Committee. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, did not go to a work session. Right. So. Okay, great. So that, that uh, really speaks to the importance of having uh, people watching the process. Correct. And having people that can be activated uh, to engage. It, it really is important. And this is probably one of those clear examples where the active participation and opposition of people through the legislative process have been successful. Yeah, and that plus the fact that uh, this reactor system is nowhere near being ready to be. The arguments on the other side were very thin, and so uh, it it was easier to puncture them than it than in many cases it would be. Right. Yeah. So uh, l let's talk about the two nuclear uh, sites in the Pacific Northwest, so uh, Hanford and the Columbia Generating Station. Yeah, and they're actually, uh, the Hanford site is is the location of the Columbia Generating Station, but it is a separate facility. Oh. The Hanford uh, Nuclear Reservation was established in the uh, 40s during uh, World War II to produce the plutonium for the bombs uh, that were developed, the, the one that was um, first explosion of a nuclear device in uh, the Alamogordo uh, desert, and then the uh, second used in war uh, on Nagasaki. The plutonium came from Hanford uh, for, for both of those explosions, and then they generated uh, tons and tons and tons of uh, plutonium for our nuclear weapons arsenal there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the Columbia Generating Station is a commercial nuclear reactor, a GE boiling water reactor of similar design to the ones that melted down in Japan at Fukushima. Uh, and it uh, was built in the 70s, finished in uh, 1983, and it's continued to operate um, there ever since. Uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and a number of other groups in the Northwest after the Fukushima accident uh, re-examined this reactor and uh, decided to 
uh, push for its its closure. Um, it would have been closed ordinarily by 2023 because uh, these reactors were originally only given 40-year um, licenses. Mm -hmm. But because nuclear power kind of petered out in the at the end of the 80s because its costs were so outrageously high and only about half of the reactors that were started were actually finished. Um, in the 90s, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission decided that they would allow the operators to extend the lives of these reactors another 20 years. So many of them applied for licenses of 60 years length, including uh, Energy Northwest, which is the operator of the Columbia Generating Station. Um, so this plant uh, received that license. It's basically a rubber stamp. The NRC has never denied a license for a reactor, either uh, in the initial build or in its uh, extension. And uh, so it now would not close, um, you know, barring either an accident or some decision uh, until 2043. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of ironic, um, or, or telling. Maybe it's more telling than it is ironic uh, that um, these have these reactors have become so expensive that there are there are none being built currently. Well, um, there's but, four. But, uh, let me, let me, let yeah, me finish sorry, the ironic ahead. part. Yeah. Uh, but, but when they were being built uh, initially, uh, Dixie Lee Ray was governor of, of Washington State, and they were uh, they, they had plans of building five plants, right. uh, the WHOOPS system. Mm -hmm. uh, and she talked about how nuclear was going to be so ch produce such cheap energy, they were not even going to have to bill it. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. Well, this was the claim of the nuclear power industry, mm -hmm. and she's a for she was a former uh, chairperson of the uh, Atomic Energy Commission before oh. she was governor of, of uh, oh, Washington. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, oh, Dixie well, Lee Ray. No wonder she was a... Uh, <laughs> she was a one-term governor. Oh, uh, yes, um, uh, right. Uh, Whoops was already being discredited by the time she uh, was was uh, running for re-election. Oh, right, yeah. So the Columbia Generating Station was one of these five stations? Correct. Right, okay, and the only one that was built. And and the, at the time, uh, it was called the Washington Public Power Supply System, or Whoops was its acronym and, and nickname. And this was the Whoops 2 plant. Uh, they've wisely since cha reach, uh, changed their name from Whoops to Energy Northwest, and, uh, and the plant is now called the Columbia Generating Station. They don't have the word nuclear in its name. I do. Uh, and uh, most people have not known that this plant really exists, mainly because there have been so many radioactive hazards and problems um, at Hanford that uh, have gotten a lot of publicity. And they've been in, able to say that they've closed all of the Hanford reactors, which is not entirely true because we still have this commercial reactor operating. Mm -hmm. But all of the production reactors for um, creating the uh, spent fuel that was then processed to make the plutonium for, uh, to, to separate the plutonium for our bomb uh, system, um, though all those reactors were shut down and are being uh, decommissioned and the, the site's being cleaned up. Okay. Yeah, um, but that's a very lengthy and a very expensive process. Extremely. Yeah, yeah. So g give us some idea where where that yeah, at Hanford where that process is at. Well, it was, you know, it's been a very contentious process, um, and it became a cleanup site officially in the '90s during the uh, Clinton administration. There were attempts to try and build new production facilities there of various types, but those were all stopped and uh, the plutonium was moved off site to uh, uh, Savannah River in, in uh, uh, South Carolina and uh, at that point it became full-time cleanup site. Um, some good progress was made in recent years um, during the Obama administration because of the stimulus package. Um, Senator Murray was able to get uh, several billion dollars of stimulus money uh, into river cleanup, and they focused on the river corridor. And they listened to the environmentalists to some degree. Uh, initially, they were thinking that they would only dig out some of the radioactive source material that was contaminating the, <coughs> the, the banks of the, of the river there, um, and because it would be expensive to, to take more of it. But then eventually were convinced to uh, basically take out 
virtually all of the strontium-90, the, the hexavalent chromium, and, and various other source materials that have, have been contaminating the Columbia River um, since they were deposited there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when, they're, when, they're, when all is said and done along the river corridor, they're, they're very close to completing that, that will be one bright spot. Not such a bright spot has been the famous or infamous liquid tank waste that's the result of the plutonium uh, extraction process. Uh, plants were uh, built further inland away from the river to extract the plutonium and uh, the byproducts were a lot of solvents, a lot of uh, hundreds of, of radioactive isotopes, some of which were extremely hot physically and radioactively. Um, and so you have these 177 tanks of semi-liquid waste that, um, some of which have been leaking. Mm -hmm. um, and the plan has been t to uh, build a large waste vitrification plant that would harden it into a glass-like substance and unfortunately this plan has had a lot of problems from day one. Uh, this waste is not uh, one common easy to categorize uh, lot of material. Uh, it's because they used a lot of different processes over the years, a lot of different types of reactors over the years and so the waste is quite varied tank to tank. Um, a one-size-fits-all vitrification plant was probably a bad idea from day one, but it never got revisited even though uh, environmentalists have been suggesting that they do so mm -hmm. since day one. Mm -hmm. um, potentially you could have a, either a hydrogen explosion there or a criticality explosion that would release enormous amounts of radioactivity, put it on the level of a Hiroshima, or not a Hiroshima, a, of, a, of a Fukushima or a Chernobyl. Uh, type of uh, release of radiation wow. into the, into and the just uh, downriver from Portland. Exactly, the Mid Columbia right. Basin into the air down downwind too, uh -huh. because we get an east wind from time yeah. to time. Oh, yeah. But downwind from Spokane potentially, or you know, it doesn't matter who. Yeah. It, it it's not going to be healthy for mm -hmm. anyone who. Right. Uh, who yeah. Has so with uh, th three minutes left. Okay. Talk about the efforts to close the Columbia Generating Station. Okay, uh, we have uh, demonstrated um, with uh, the help of Union of Concerned Scientists that this reactor has enough similarity to the ones that melted down in Fukushima that if, if water or power were cut off for even a relatively short period of a few hours there, that you could have a Fukushima accident in our airshed. Mm. Um, and we uh, hired a geologist who has studied the, the region uh, through the U, uh, U.S. Geologic Survey, Geological Survey, and he summarized the data there. This plant was built to withstand uh, a, um, react, a, a uh, earthquake that's uh, uh, 0.25 G ground motion at the plant site, and the potential there is for a 0.5 or 0.6. Mm. Uh, and finally, um, the cost of this reactor and replacement of it. We've, we hired uh, um, Robert McCullough, who is a local economist, uh, and he found that it could be replaced affordably, and most recently in the study that was completed this year, he found that it could be replaced carbon-free more affordably than continuing to operate it. Mm. The price of wind and solar and uh, energy conservation ha is such now that that uh, even operating an existing nuclear plant that's built is more expensive than uh, than replacing mm -hmm. it. Okay. And so, are there efforts to actually convince them to close down, or yes. what's the process for actually well, doing Well, we've it convinced this in a minute and a half. Yeah, this, the city of Seattle um, has uh, taken a position for uh, closing the plant and replacing it, uh, phasing it out, um, and replacing it in a carbon-free way. Mm -hmm. uh, the carbon-free aspect of this is important nowadays and we've uh, acknowledged that, uh, that nuclear power doesn't generate uh, as much CO2 as either coal or natural gas. But the um, city of, of Seattle is, uh, um, their municipal utility is part of Energy Northwest, so they're a voting member on the board. Oh, okay. We're in the process of talking with Clark County PUD, which is also another board 
uh, has another board seat and with the Tacoma Municipal Utility and a number of others. Plus, Oregon utilities have a stake in this as well because all of the power generated at the Columbia Generating Station is purchased by Bonneville through a, an agreement. Bonneville is required to buy all of the power and then resell it yeah. to all of its customers. So if you're a Forest Grove uh, municipal buyer or Canby or mm -hmm. McMinnville or Eugene Water and Electric Board, your power is higher and you're also helping to keep this dangerous reactor operating. Okay. So we're, we're so talking to those. People, people might contact their utilities, if particularly if it's a public utility, and, and say you want them to withdraw exactly. away from it. Okay, great. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Thank you very Thank much you. for being here, Chuck, again. It's, it's great. Okay. We'll look forward to having you on again. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Yeah. So we are now going to go to a, um, an interview I did with Dan Meek, a uh, Portland attorney. Um, uh, and a, the legal advisor to the Oregon Progressive Party uh, talking about a couple of, um, of uh, things going on in the Oregon legislature. So uh, we'll go there now. So we are uh, back here with Dan Meek. Uh, we uh, left him uh, last talking about campaign finance reform and the, and the low markings that Oregon gets as a state uh, with that regard. Uh, now, uh, Dan wants to talk about what the legislature is doing to something which is a progressive, as he described it, as a progressive icon uh, in Oregon, uh, the bottle bill. So what's the legislature doing with the bottle bill? Well, Oregon gets lots of credit for before having a, a bottle bill, and but it's, being, it's uh, being, I think, sabotaged by the Oregon legislature. Um, back in 2011, the Oregon legislature passed a law that expanded the reach of the bottle bill to cover more bottles. Right now, it only covers basically carbonated beverages. So ju just what is the bottle bill before oh, you start? The bottle bill <clears throat> was passed by the legislature back in the 1970s and required that carbonated beverages um, in bottles and cans have a deposit value and a refund value of five cents. So when you buy those things, you're charged an extra five cents in deposit and then when you return the bottles to the store, uh, you're supposed to get your five cents back. Mm -hmm. And that was to encourage recycling and to reduce littering. Mm -hmm. um, and it was pretty successful on both counts. Pretty successful. Many other states have adopted it, and, and most states that have adopted it have applied it to a far greater variety of bottles than Oregon does, and have increased the deposit to 10 cents and not five cents like Oregon is, is stuck with. So um, in 2011, Oregon uh, legislature passed a law that basically doubled the, the number of bottles that would be covered. Instead of just carbonated beverages, it extends it to all human beverage containers, all containers with things that humans drink, mm -hmm. except for, as the, as the table indicates there, distilled liquor, wine, dairy, or plant-based milk like almond milk, and infant formula. So everything else, as the next chart indicates, is covered, including coffee, tea, hard cider, fruit juice, kombucha, whatever that, whatever that is, <laughs> and coconut water, I mean, all kinds of waters. Um, so that'll basically double the number of bottles uh, that are, the, for which you'll be charged a deposit when you go to the grocery store. And, and consequently, the number of bottles that will actually get recycled. You would think. Right. And the deposit is not going, as of uh, April 1st of this year, the, the deposit on, the, on covered bottles goes up, went up from five cents to 10 cents. So you're going to have twice as many bottles starting next January, and the deposit will be twice as much as it has been in the past. So um, basically, the average, you know, grocery bill that you're going to be looking at for beverages is going to increase rather substantially because more bottles, more deposits. So what happens if the uh, if you pay your deposit for a bottle at the grocery store and then you never take it back to the grocery store? Or to the recycling center and get in and get your five cents back or get your ten cents back. What happens to that money? Well, uh, oh, what happens to the money? Mm -hmm. I, I know if I had a can such as that, I would put it down in my recycle bin, and then someone uh, would come along the street and pick it out uh, while the bin was out and, and would would uh, well, let's say would, would refund it. But that's that's another way to get it refunded. Right. Let's say it's not refunded. You, oh, you just throw it. It's just thrown it's, away and it's up in a landfill. Throw. Who mm -hmm. gets the five? Who gets the ten cents? Well, uh, I presume it would go back to the state for administering the program. Uh, you would be wrong. 
Um, that's the way the programs work in California, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and other states. Uh, all the money goes back to the, unrefunded money goes back to the state. In New York, uh, retains 80% of unclaimed refunds. Michigan retains 75% of unclaimed refunds. Oregon retains none of it. All of the money goes to the beverage companies, the beverage wow. distributors. And this chart shows how much money that is. It's not, it is a large amount. Starting in 2012, it was about $22 million. Uh, in 2015, it was $30 million. It's expected to be $60 million in unclaimed deposit. goes back to the beverage industry in 2017. They are making more money on unclaimed deposits than profits on their beverages. <laughs> and this number is too low because that doesn't account for the fact that the Oregon legislature just this past month and was signed by the governor, Governor Brown, signed a law to eliminate the requirement for the year 20, for all of the year 2018, that beverage containers be accurately labeled as to their refund value. Now, let's say you've got a bottle, you had a bottle of water, and you think, I'm, I wonder if this is refundable. Should I refund this or should I throw it out? Mm -hmm. You look at it to see if it's got that OR five cent on it. Um, that's required by law, the, the, the label. The Oregon legislature suspended that law for the year 2018. So on all of these new containers like grapefruit juice or whatever or kombucha or coconut water or cider or whatever, those bottles don't have to have be labeled at all with any refund value. So you pay the deposit, there's nothing to remind you that you pay the deposit right. and you throw it away and the beverage company gets the pocket. Cents. That's right. So what a deal. What a deal. And I'm wondering if you take these bottles back to the store, they don't say they're refundable, what's the store going to do? Refund them, especially a small grocery store oh. that doesn't have any electronic equipment. Even so, even if they had electronic equipment, there's no, you know, it doesn't have to be barcoded as refundable either. Hmm. So that's, that's what the Oregon legislature that's, has done that's, with That's with, the with Oregon that. legislature working for you. One more example, if I might. Yeah, sure. And that is um, the Oregon Indoor Clean Air Act. That's also a good thing. Mm -hmm. it, it applies to workplaces, it applies to public places like bars, restaurants, lobbies, etc. It says you can't have smoking in those areas. Well, um, what the Oregon legislature is working on now, a bill that has passed the Senate by a vote, as I recall, 27 to 2, and is now in the Oregon House, Senate Bill 235A, defines the term enclosed area. The Clean Air Act only applies to enclosed areas. So what's an enclosed area? Well, the new definition would mean the entirety of the space between a floor and a ceiling that is enclosed on three or more sides by permanent or temporary walls or windows that extend from the floor to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what does that mean? Let's say that you've got a room where you've got three walls, um, but one of them, or even four walls, let's say you've got four walls, but two of them have a one inch crack at the top. That's no longer under Oregon law, under this new law, it's not an enclosed area. So the protection against, uh, against indoor air quality and, and smoking no longer applies there. So I would anticipate a lot of construction activity to shorten <laughs> walls. <laughs> well, this is going, it means that the, the protections of the act no, will no longer apply in many areas like, like, like almost enclosed patios for restaurants where it doesn't have at least oh. three complete walls. If it doesn't have three complete walls all the way from the floor all the way to the ceiling, it's now no longer covered. You know, the patio frequently doesn't have a ceiling, so. Right, or it might have a, a there might be a gap or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, regardless of, of bad ventilation and regardless of the level of contamination, um, that's what that does. And, and also, this bill received, this, this provision received no hearing whatsoever. The bill, if you look it up in the legislature, the bill actually, uh, as introduced, established a licensing system on tobacco vendors. Hmm. You know, it's a bill relating to tobacco. Oh, good, a licensing system on tobacco to keep you know, tobacco and, and inhalants out of the hands of minors. But, and it had a hearing on February 9th, and I, te and I testified for it. Good bill. Mm -hmm. So then, two months later, the, the so-called Senate Health Committee had a, <laughs> had a work session at which no public testimony is allowed, and at the work session, they adopted an amendment that totally abolished the exit the bill that had been introduced and had a public hearing gone and replaced it with just this thing. Hmm. Just let's just change the definition of enclosed area. So there's been no hearing on that whatsoever. And it's already passed. Passed the Oregon Senate. Oh, so it's still still and so possible now it's over in the House. The house. Okay. 
uh, public hearing in the House was this past week. I again testified against it. And turns out I'm not the only one who, who recognizes the Oregon Nurses Association also also pointed it. No, the Oregon Public Oregon Health Authority pointed out that um, that it allows smoking in uh, in areas where it's not allowed now. Mm -hmm. So it is a it is a, it is a way to expand smoking. Yeah. Which so of this is a public health disaster. Yeah, this this was one of those uh, stuff and gut uh, things where you get rid of the old legislation, put something else in, don't have a hearing on it, just a vote. That's right. It's called gut and stuff. <clears throat> that happens frequently and happens more you know, as the legislature goes on. The legislature is supposed to adjourn by the first week of July, uh, unless they decide to extend the session, which they can, which they can do. They're only supposed to be in session six months in in uh, odd numbered years. The Oregon legislative process is pretty, um, is fairly uh, frustrating. That is, you can go online if you Google Oregon legislature or an OLIS, O L I S, Oregon Legislative Information System. You can find all of the bills online, um, and you can you can then uh, determine you have to determine in order to submit testimony where which committee each bill is assigned to. And then you have to find that committee's email address and then email them the testimony. However, your testimony will not be accepted unless the bill has been scheduled for hearing. Mm. So if you're if you submit it too soon, it's tossed away. They don't keep it. They don't keep it on online on file and then file it when the hearing happens. They just say you have to you have to determine when our hearing is. You have to watch the legislative agenda every day to see when this is coming up again, mm -hmm. and then submit it again. And then. Um, once the hearing is over on that day, uh, no more testimony is accepted. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an absurd system. And yep. then they have a work session weeks later, days or weeks later, at which they can totally change the bill to something totally different and have no testimony whatsoever. Okay, and so this would be part of the reason why we get Fs. This is, well, remember, we did get a D minus, a D minus. on legislative accountability. Yep. So yep. Our, our, our time is up. Thank you very much <laughs> for continuing to talk. All right. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you for joining us today on the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. We talked with Charles Johnson, the Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibilities Task Force on Nuclear Power and Portland legal advisor to the Oregon Progressive Party, Dan Meek. So I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.